to the continuing Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture Series. This is our first event since the eviction from Dewey Square last month. And the title of this event is From Occupy to Workers' Control. From the book, um, Ours to Master and to Own, with uh, Emmanuel Ness and Elaine Bernard, who contributed to both. And we're very much in a stage two of the Occupy movement. Uh, occupations across the United States have been evicted, and I believe just today or yesterday a court ruled against Occupy London. So we're very much seeing a stage two in this movement. And to give an example, there's ever since the eviction there's been questions, what do we do now? How do we realize what the Boston, Occupy Boston's Declaration of Occupation. Our goal is a society that prioritizes the needs of all before the profits of a few. How do we exactly realize that? And there's been talk about occupying foreclosed homes for one. Th and this event, though, is focused more on occupying your job. What would it mean for this movement to take power in a workplace, in a factory, somewhere else? How could we do that? How could it be realized? And hopefully our two speakers can help illuminate us on, on that question. So I'd like uh, you all to give a nice warm welcome to Emmanuel Ness and Elaine Bernard. Um, thank you, Doug, very much for that introduction. Uh, people can call me Manny, uh, unless you prefer otherwise. Um, I was asked to speak on the uh, issue as it relates to the United States, the issue of worker, factory, and enterprise occupations. Um, and um, start by saying that this is part of the American tradition that uh, has continued. People often think of uh, factory worker occupations as something that uh, takes place in, in very obscure situations and is not continuous throughout history. But if we take a look at the uh, long, uh, let's say 150 years or so, uh, we will find that there's been a continuous effort of workers to, if not uh, occupy their workplaces, take control over their workplaces, produce in their workplaces, uh, at least maybe even run their workplaces within a capitalist uh, system. And that continues to this day. So we're not talking about some obscure topic. Uh, I'd like to start with this one point that uh, I've read in many places since everybody's talking about worker occupation, well, occupations in general uh, of the public square, working class occupations, that um, the occupations of public spaces is the natural extension of occupations of workplaces. And I'm not going to say one or the other. I would obviously say, but I will tell you my opinion, that I think that occupying workplaces and enterprises is a much larger task and one that in fact re is representative of a facet of public occupations. And in this context, I'm looking at the idea of a workers' council, something that uh, we, some of us have thought about for all our lives, and people before us uh, thought about that, how to achieve that. A country was named after workers' councils, a nation state, that thought it, it created its own international, that was Soviet Union, and that um, this aspiration, I would argue, is related to tying together working class communities with working class workplaces. 
You know, per, we are, and we have example after example of this process. So, uh, given that I was asked to talk about the United States, um, certainly we come out of a tradition uh, of workplace autonomy within the craft unions, that craft workers in the 19th century demanded a uh, certain respect and uh, were producers on their own and uh, after a period of time um, under uh, the AFL were able to uh, dictate wages uh, that were imposed uh, you know, by their, their unions, the craft unions. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, we have the foundation of mass production industries, which creates a whole new uh, paradigm for the working class. I was saying it yesterday, that, you know, we only really have 40 years to look at with respect to neoliberal, oh, forgive me, uh, Fordist production, uh, roughly between the 1920s and the 1970s, well, give maybe 50 years or so. But after a period of time, this becomes broken down uh, to uh, uh, production within factories rooted in different types of skill categories, and subcontracting to people within the factory and outside of the factory, so that sometimes you might have a factory that seemingly has a, you know, a placard on it that produces one thing but may have workers who are employed for many different companies and many different, uh, the airports for instance would be a good example of that, even within uh, you know, airlines uh, or um, many different transportation sectors and hospitals, education and so forth. Uh, so we are living in a post-Fortis environment, but let's look at, at the period when labor was ascendant in this country, where uh, the CIO and then the AFL uh, understood that the industrial workers of the world uh, knew all along that you had to create a factory-based union, uh, that skill was being taken away from workers in the working class, and that if you really want to build working class power and a modicum of a decent wage and build communities that were able to sustain themselves, you had to do so by organizing everybody, wall-to-wall -wall unionism as we all know here. Um, I think that there is a specific era, you know, building on what the IWW did that we really need to look at and that's roughly between 1935 and uh, the war. 1939, 1940, particularly 1939 with the Fan Steel decision by the Supreme Court, which rules that factory occupations are illegal because it's occupying private property. Um, and we don't have a capitalist state. Uh, you know, I mean, one would wonder, you know, decision after, I mean, you know as well as I do that decision after decision is anti working class. Uh, the Toledo auto light strike is uh, an inspiring example of the way in which uh, workers and the community banded together to create a sense of solidarity through um, uh, defending the workers' rights within the glass industry and trying to create a union that would be uh, powerful in, uh, in Toledo. Uh, and uh, it was attacked uh, by the police. Uh, several people were killed by the police. Uh, several people occupied the buildings for a period of time, but not long enough to really sustain it for more than a few days. Uh, but just on its heels, there are many other occupations. I'll just talk about the most well-known that you know about. Uh, the second would be the Flint sit-down strike, which, uh, you know, I, it, it's a ex wonderful example of what can be achieved through the workers, and in this context, without a union. You know, the Flint workers sat down without a union. They wanted a union, and they sat down for a union and better working conditions. And I, I'll just throw this out for you for a moment. It's my sense that working class people felt, you know, judging from, you know, looking at what the IWW believed in, direct action, uh, we don't negotiate with the employer, we don't believe in the legitimacy of the state and so forth, that if they could only get a union, Maybe they could create something called socialism. 
I, I, I believe that to be the case if you look at the historical record and some archival material on these strikes uh, that take place in the 30s, that workers were actually more militant than their union leaders. Well, that's usually the case. But in this way, the, the union was a, a means to, in some ways, institutionalize the power that was created by workers sitting down in the factory in Flint. And there are a lot of good books, historical books, Sidney Fine's work and others. You might disagree somewhere with the politics, but the, the detail is so precise of how the process is engaged in. You know, what is step one? What is step two? Uh, which block will the uh, workers uh, occupy? How will workers get food? How will workers, you know, get uh, entertainment? You know, how do you get books to workers and so forth? Those are very important aspects of those worker occupations. And subsequent to that, uh, they, they got a union, and that union was extended uh, to the auto industry uh, for about 30, 40 years, uh, industry-wide. Now, this is not a discussion about Rutherism, so I'll stop on that discussion for a moment and move on to a union that I think is really uh, quite interesting uh, and, that, and, and probably very important, even if it doesn't have many members today, it's the United Electrical Workers. Um, they were engaged in sit-down strikes, uh, and also they learned lessons from uh, the IWW uh, as well. Uh, there was a nut-picking uh, operation uh, someplace in the uh, Midwest, southern mi Midwest, uh, I forget the name of it at the moment, uh, where uh, African-American women uh, engaged in a sit-down strike in a factory where they did, uh, was it pecans? I believe it was pecans. Uh, Peter Ratchliffe writes about it. He's got a little pamphlet that uh, the IWW produced. And, and in this case, people learn lessons that if you are able to sit down and take over the operations, uh, and in fact, uh, perhaps produce, in this case they didn't, you actually have a lot more power than you might have otherwise. So there is a historical tradition that is rooted in many different uh, communities, racial communities, gendered communities, um, and people of all ages uh, uh, that were engaged in sit-down strikes. Uh, very briefly, the Emerson sit-down strike, which doesn't get as much uh, uh, attention, but I think perhaps might be uh, more instructive than even the Flint sit-down strike. Uh, this was something that had complete support of its rank-and-file members. Many of the leaders, in this case the strike leaders, the union had a lot to do with the strike. The UE was politically uh, motivated. Um, it was a communist union uh, of a sort. Uh, and they were um, basically organizing their members and thinking about socialism, and, you know, and so forth. And we're talking about a period, well, a period during, right before the war, and, uh, well, I guess it's after Stalin consolidates power, too, so that's a problem, perhaps. Uh, but in this case, it was completely shut down and occupied by the workers. Not one person uh, broke that occupation. It had complete support amongst the rank and file workers, who are young people, who are women, who are people of all ages. And that memory, that historical memory of, memory of Emerson Electric, which, by the way, is a company that's still around today, um, uh, is still there in St. Louis. And it actually contributed to subsequent uh, uh, efforts to create a certain degree of control over the workplace. Um, so very, very briefly, you know, after this major sit-down in, in Emerson and, and then a wave of sit-downs throughout the country, um, too many to mention, uh, you have the organization of capital, which is very concerned with this event, this set of events, uh, and uh, its effort to intervene through uh, the Fanstein decision, which the Supreme Court obviously you know, makes it uh, illegally, illegal. And I actually, the question about law is a difficult one, but I, I'll just give you a quick uh, perspective. Yeah, the law is very important. People are afraid that they might get arrested and all these other things. But, you know, the real enforcers of the law are the union leaders uh, who don't recognize the fact that 
workers may be more interested uh, in creating a democratic workplace, and that I view union leaders and unions in general as devolving into intermediaries between labor and capital, and they need capital as much as labor, and over the years I think they, in many interests, defend management and capital more than they do labor. You know, they don't want, you know, they, they're the representatives of labor, and you see increasingly when you don't have rank-and-file unionism or rank-and-file democracy, uh, they don't even talk to the union members. And that's the, forgive me, the SEIU model in many ways today. Uh, I, I don't mean it because there are a lot of very good SEIU uh, people in this state and other places around the country. It's not a blanket statement on the SEIU. It's not even a blanket statement on the UAW before. Uh, not, in, not in this state. Uh, I think you've got a better even. Sound like a blanket statement to me. Oh, okay. All right, so anyway, so just moving very quickly to... Uh, is my time almost up? Oh, okay, uh, to the UE. Uh, case of uh, 2008, where we are all familiar with the Republic window and door uh, sit down, uh, where it really wasn't so much United Electrical Workers, it was actually the rank and file that discovered this company was going to shut down. They, they employed about four or five hundred workers and they were going to move to someplace south that wasn't exactly clear, or Illinois or some, well, some southern Illinois, someplace like that. I think it was Iowa. And in this context, the uh, workers got wind of it, they went to the UE leadership and they set up a plan and an uh, effort to uh, take over the factory before the uh, means of production uh, of an industry that, by the way, is growing dramatically. Everybody needs uh, insulation in their, their apartments and houses and it's not an industry that will ever go away. Uh, the employer apparently was uh, somewhat rapacious and stole money from the company as well as from uh, the workers and so forth and had a line of credit from major banks including Bank of America and Citicorp I believe uh, if I'm wrong uh, please forgive me but it doesn't matter uh, the fact of the matter in this context uh, the workers actually uh, kicked out a union that was in place before uh, five years earlier and brought in a new union. And I think this is a very interesting phenomenon that we could actually envision, and it's also happened in Argentina, in Argentina uh, countless times, and other countries where the old union is seen as uh, corrupt, is seen as disinterested in representing the interests of uh, their members, um, collecting dues is what they cared about. And it, there's nothing wrong with you know dues check off necessarily, but it, it was all that the union really cared about. It was, uh, I think, the Chicago uh, District uh, Regional Union. It was an all-purpose union. And um, in some ways, one can look at the UE uh, uh, sit-down and see, uh, see kind of echoes of uh, the industrial workers of the world and so forth. There's, there's a degree to which these workers want to um, you know, take over the factory, uh, believe that capital is the major force, especially financial capital, in uh, diminishing their ability to survive. These people are working class Latinos and African Americans primarily who took over the plant. So we're talking about a population that uh, likely includes, most certainly includes, uh, people who are undocumented. Uh, who actually engaged in this inspirational uh, takeover that even the president-elect Obama could not uh, say in any way was uh, uh, illegal. He actually took the side of the workers before he became president, as you remember. Um, so um, and there's a lot to say about this, uh, but time is short. I can talk, talk for hours, but I actually don't like to. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elaine, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Actually, I should tell you uh, how I ended up writing a chapter in this book is that uh, a couple of years ago, Manny and I were at a conference together, and he was uh, just running a, a seminar, or one of the uh, uh, sections of it, on workers' control, and of course, I really wanted to go because I felt very strongly that this is a topic 
whose time has again come. Now remember, this is like over two years before the Occupy movement, and I was thrilled that he was uh, doing this. And we happened to get talking, and I told him about, you know, very important formative uh, experience I had in uh, British Columbia, where I'm originally from, in the 1980s, when I was with the Telecommunication Workers Union, and uh, that union in the uh, February of 1981 uh, seized the phone exchanges province-wide, uh, ran them for five days, totally under workers' control. They didn't, uh, they locked out management, as, as we said at the time, all non-necessary people were asked <laughs> to leave the buildings, and in fact, when we uh, got them out, it was remarkable. Uh, not only did the atmosphere change in the buildings, but the work uh, actually uh, greatly improved. Uh, people in British Columbia got the best telephone service they ever had in their lives for those five days when the workers ran the phone exchange. And you, you can imagine Canada, you know, is, is, is not a commune. It's not socialist. Uh, it's, uh, it's a country very much like the United States, you know, sort of Minnesotans with health care and without guns. Um, but, but, you know, such an action is just sort of really quite extraordinary. At the time, I was fairly young, so I didn't think it was extraordinary. I thought this is the way things should go, and uh, it took a, a number of years before I realized that this actually was pretty extraordinary. And sort of counter, a little, uh, not to disagree with Manny, but to give the counter side is this was contemporary workers. This wasn't the uh, Paris Commune. This wasn't, uh, you know, somewhere far away with workers who are very different. Uh, it was unionized workers. It was uh, majority female workers. It was uh, workers who, by the way, were relatively conservative. Uh, these were not socialist workers. These were actually relatively well-paid unionized workers uh, who were in the private sector. And just to add to the contradictions, it was successful in spite of the fact that it was illegal. So how do we put all of this sort of counters together? Well, you need to step back and, and, and let me give you a little bit of the story of the dispute and because how it happened might tell us a little bit about how it might happen again. First, these workers were very traditional unionists. They were so traditional that there were women's jobs and men's jobs. And men were the cable splicers and the line men, and women were the telephone operators and the clericals. And we used to, and they tended to be people who came from the industry, worked their whole lives in the industry, had children who then grew up to actually get involved in the industry. We used to jokingly say that, you know, hello girls, marry cable splicers and have little linemen. Uh, so it was, you know, very, very uh, interesting. It, it was an industry that went through some major technological changes. And, uh, and the union had been involved in some fairly heavy disputes, the last one of which was in 77, 78, where the union was locked out for uh, a few months in the middle of winter and uh, came back uh, at the end of the dispute angry. Workers were angry, they felt they had lost uh, uh, that strike and that they were living in uh, a workplace that was a battlefield. And so the union then, talking with its members, started to develop a strategy and realized that first the phone company and the phone industry could run without workers. It's fairly automated. So they could lock out workers, have a few supervisors who would run it, and you know the public would continue to pay their phone bills or have their phones cut off. And you know, and the workers were out on the street like a bunch of bums. And no matter how the public says, oh, we like you, uh, when there's a strike on, they still pay their bills. Uh, they, you know, and the workers are out on the street. So as a union, we said, this, this isn't right. This is not going to happen again. What do we need to do? Well, the first thing we needed to do is we needed to talk to the public. 
we need it to actually do more than talk to the public, you know, respect us, blah, blah, blah. We need it to actually get on the side of the public because what was hurting the workers was hurting the public as far as the communications industry, that the company's speed up, the company's automation, the co was removing from a very human industry the human factor. So it was building not just, you know, the sort of, we'll come to your community center and please support us because we're about to go into a dispute. Serious, serious work. And one of the most serious pieces we did is we did something that most unions don't do. The telephone industry at that time was regulated. So when uh, the companies wanted to increase their fees, they had to go before a government regulatory hearing. Uh, the union decided to intervene in this hearing. And the union decided to intervene in opposition to the phone company getting a rate increase. Well, you can imagine the union meeting discussing why we're going to do that. Because a rate increase is the basis upon which the company gets more money, of which, if you're going into bargaining with the company, you want them to have more money. But instead, what we did was line up with the community groups, with consumer coalitions, which in the past had been the enemy of the phone union, because it sided with management, and instead line up with those groups and say no rate increase as long as uh, you know this phone industry, this phone company is doing terrible service. And then went even one step further. The union became the whistleblower. So the union started to leak stuff about what the company was doing. Again, very, very sort of over the top compared to what unions often do, but decided that, you know, and the members loved it. They got to testify about how they wanted to give better service. They had all sorts of ideas how to improve things, uh, and yet, you know, the company was just not permitting it. And uh, I'll get back to this consumer producer coalition, how important that is. Well, eventually, uh, we dragged out, and the first time, it was the longest hearings in Canadian history, it went 40 days, uh, and, uh, and the company got its rate increase. It then proceeded to try and force the union into a lockout by starting to lay people off, uh, and eventually what happened is uh, a decision was made that we weren't going out, they were. And uh, uh, I won't go into the details, you can read it in the article, but they were locked out and we were on the inside. Uh, it took the courts a day or two to sort of, because first they couldn't believe it. Uh, that, you know, normally, you know, workers seize the phone exchanges. Uh, you know, that's not a North American story. That's not, uh, uh, and, uh, and it, it was actually quite funny because the, the police had a role in this. Uh, that is, the local police were called by the phone company and said, you know, this is, this is illegal. They're, uh, uh, you know, they're occupying the phone exchanges. Uh, you know, you got to go in there. Remember, phone exchanges often go back to World War II, and on the West Coast, they were built with reinforced concrete, and you know you couldn't get a tank in there. So they're very, very well protected. Which you know, if you're going to see something, see something that's really well protected. Uh, it's very hard to come and get you out. So what happened is, police said, um, actually, we think this is about industrial relations, uh, and it really isn't our business. And uh, and also, we don't work for the phone company nor for management. You know, we'll get back to you if the you know if the courts order us, if the chief does. But we're we're not involved in this. And it was uh, very interesting. Part of that was because the union also talked to the police. Not before, of course, uh, but afterwards. And, and we had a fair amount of neutrality there. Uh, again, uh, part of it was the very powerful resource that was being held. Uh, you really don't want to mess with uh, the uh, uh, communications uh, uh, system. So what happened is eventually we were ordered out we then had to talk to the members, because some members said, well, to hell with them, let's stay. 
And some said, well, you know, now all of a sudden we're in contempt of court, we could be arrested, etc. The union did something that, again, which is why you need a, 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 some sort of democratic way of making decisions. In this case, the union executive board in discussion decided that uh, some of our folks would stay and some wouldn't. And the worst thing possible in this would be for some to leave, some to stay, and to rupture the, the solidarity that was there. So it was determined that we were seeking a collective agreement, not stage one of the Canadian Revolution, and therefore we would obey the courts. We disagreed with the court decision, but we would obey it. Uh, we then chose to come out of the buildings at noon because it would make it to the press the, that evening for the six o'clock news in the east. And we did it with the building trades closing down the center of the city at noon hours so that they could be there watching the occupants come out of the building. So it was a tremendous moment of solidarity. And the agreement was that in coming out, the rest of the labor movement would support the foam workers by then starting to choose different cities around the province to have one day general strikes uh, in support and the first one was held in Nanaimo. And at that point, the business community, as well as government, laid so heavily on the phone company that a collective agreement once again uh, uh, achieved. Well, why am I telling you a story of 1981 in the little west coast uh, province of, uh, of British Columbia? Because there's a couple of things there that are very interesting about what could happen. First is, there's a lot of romanticism about occupations, you know, that it's going to be, you know, the politically correct. I love the farm workers because they were, they were never politically correct. They were never particularly left. They were never, and they were female. But what happened is they developed a tremendous sense of entitlement, that this was work that they did that was valuable, that wasn't just about how they earned their living, it was about the community that they lived in and what we were successful in doing is making the company the outsider, management the outsider, as opposed to the union, its members, and the public. That was the coalition. I call those producer and consumer coalitions. And we're seeing that more and more in the labor movement, but really it's about going that extra, extra step. The, the second thing is that it was, um, it moved very, very quickly. I said they were conservative union members. Once the occupation started,